tweet in with the hashtag Moss at TES. Aaron will be on stage, he'll be following the questions, and he'll be asking Dr. Moss with your feedback. There'll also be an open Q&A session afterwards, so feel free to stand up and introduce yourself, your major, what team you're on, if you're one semester start up, and ask a question. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dean Bendis from the Cochrane School of Engineering. Uh, well, welcome, uh, and I want to thank uh, the TES and special, especially uh, Muriel and uh, Aaron for uh, this wonderful program this evening and all that the Technology Entrepreneurship Society is doing. Uh, I'm a great believer in entrepreneurship and what the University of Texas uh, can be doing and should be doing uh, in, that, in that area. I think that is a tremendous <coughs> Uh, aspect of, of education and uh, the young entrepreneurs who are in our academic programs are going to go out and make tremendous changes, uh, particularly around the world of technology to solve important problems. Now Austin is a unique place to be doing this. Uh, we have that as part of the Austin DNA. Uh, we have that as part of the culture of the University of Texas. And uh, the Entrepreneurship Society is a really key component to that. So I'm very glad that uh, you're putting this program together. And talking about the DNA of Austin, uh, one of the, uh, the original genes of that DNA is here this evening, Frank Moss, who you're all here to listen to. And uh, when I moved to Austin a couple of years ago, I kept hearing about this company, Chibble, and how it changed the scene in Austin uh, as an exciting place uh, for technology and for innovation. And Frank had a key role in the uh, development of that company, uh, the successful IPO, and then uh, the eventual sale. And Tivoli alumni are around Austin and around this world, and so many of them talk about uh, the impact that uh, Tivoli had on creating Austin as a, as a true technology center. But Frank didn't stop there. Uh, he went back to his alma mater, uh, MIT, and uh, I think as many of you know, uh, uh, got quite a bit of renown and fame at the MIT Media Lab, uh, leading that through some crucial years in the, uh, uh, the past decade, uh, putting it really on the map as a, as a place where uh, ideas, uh, technology, uh, uh, solving, uh, working on social problems, uh, the new role of media has had such a, such a huge impact. And so I think we're very fortunate uh, tonight to have Frank back in his hometown for uh, a brief part of his life, an important part of his life, uh, to talk with you and to especially talk with students about uh, the role that entrepreneurship has had in his life and, and that we can all learn from uh, some of the lessons uh, that he's gathered and he's written about extensively. So we're very pleased to have with us this evening at the University of Texas, Dr. Frank Moss. Hey, are we on? Uh, Hello? How's, uh, how's that sound? Can you guys hear it? Oh, I'm not on yet. Can you turn it on? Right. Mark, so, can you hear that? No. I'm not waiting. No, wait, no, wait, no, 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 no. Okay, okay, great. How about me? <coughs> no, not yet. Turn the button on. Yeah. 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 How about, uh, how about that? That's yeah. nice. Okay, cool. I uh, just, uh, by the way, uh, back when we were talking about the hashtag, it's Moss, capital M, and lowercase a t, and then t s is capitalized. Just uh, after after the after I asked him, uh, Dr. Moss a couple of questions, and more than a couple of questions, because he has a lot to say about uh, entrepreneurship and startups. Uh, we'll we'll head over to your questions, which I uh, I'm very interested in seeing what you guys want to know about starting uh, your own company um, just a little about uh, a little bit about TES we we are here to help you guys uh, do whatever we're, we're here to do whatever we can to help you uh, get your startups going and, and to 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 fulfill your your venture goals but uh, let's, uh, let's get right to it I, well, I, I, I would say when I left Austin about 12 or 13 years ago, whatever it was, I didn't think I'd come back as a hashtag. <laughs> 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 Who knew, right? 
everything changes so quickly. And, it does. Yeah. And, uh, but but you had a, a big part to do with the very beginning. Of, uh, the let, let's uh, talk about Tivoli first of all. Since well, before we do that, um, okay. I need to get comfortable. Oh. So, um, oh. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Little music place. Yeah. <laughs> Marvin Gaye. Uh, no, just a little, <laughs> little Sixth Street kind of music. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, now we're ready. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Better represent the Okay, good. I feel better now. How how long have you been waiting to do that? Uh, I've been thinking about this for about 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, no, my wife, uh, she said, if you're going down to Austin, Kim, who typically folks remember, said, can you get rid of some of those Tivoli t-shirts? <laughs> they kind of give them out down there. So, you know, I just brought one down there. So. Oh, that's great. I, you know, I was looking at that shirt the whole time, and I had no idea what you had a new sleeve. That was pretty tricky, or not? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, so early early on, um, you you started your, your career actually um, um, overseas. As I, as I know, you you ta taught at uh, IBM Scientific Career uh, in in center in, in Haifa, Israel. I everybody I looked up and looking back, uh, was that first career decision of one that when you look back as a as a good one? Would you would you change anything? If, uh, <laughs> well, that's a good question. Before I begin, though, talking about myself, I do want to thank uh, yourself, and I want to thank the Tempest and every uh, Bob here for inviting me down uh, to that's It's just a real pleasure to be back here. I uh, spent the evening at the W, and uh, who knew uh, <laughs> back then uh, how Austin would progress? And so, you know, I'm pleased that uh, you know I'm recognized as having some small part of this, but. Um, most of it was luck. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm going to, you know, debunk everything. And there's a lot of wisdom behind this, although I'll try and spread some wisdom. Uh, but most of it was luck. But most of it was the fact that this is a very special place, <coughs> and it's very close to our heart. My daughter was only about one year old when we came, and so she, although as a senior in college, she still says she, she's from Austin, and she wears her cowboy boots as I do, only when I come down here. Um, but it's such a pleasure. I'm, uh, Really delighted to be back here. It's a lot of fun. I intend to go out tonight and, and see what's going on in Sixth Street at the park. So, uh, so that's really the important part. But, uh, thank you again for having me down. Um, do I regret or, or uh, the question was? So, uh, uh, UG yeah. students have an opportunity to take a study abroad uh, programs to, to partake in study abroad, uh, abroad programs. Right. Um, as an entrepreneur, and, and uh, I, I wonder if uh, entrepreneurs in this room. I uh, wonder if uh, going abroad uh, has any opportunities that they might not uh, get, you know, here. Well, you know, I, um, I spent about a year in, uh, in Israel after I graduated from MIT. Um, but I think the more important part was with IBM, we had a small scientific center there. Um, but um, when I came back <laughs> to really get a real job, uh, I got a real job at, at, uh, at IBM Research, uh, and I spent the first five or six years of my career at a big company at, at IBM. And uh, I'm often asked nowadays, well, should I go to a big company? A lot of the students at the media lab were asking me that. Or do we just go do a startup? Because everybody just wants to go do a startup and skip that other part of their career. Right? Um, but there were a lot of uh, people at Tivoli um, who had come from uh, IBM. Uh, in fact, uh, the founders of Tivoli, several, several of them came from IBM. Uh, and he, here, some came from Texas Instruments and elsewhere. And I actually think, and I'd be curious, I'm always going to defer to the Tivoli people here who, uh, you know, bring as much to the table uh, with regard to Tivoli as I did, that a lot of the diverse ideas that were brought from these different big companies, uh, I think contributed in some ways to our success because all of us have been through different things before. And so, um, if things are different today, um, big companies are different and play a different role. Uh, but I think I learned a lot at IBM Research in the early days, and not just about uh, you know, technology and research, but about some of the principles that IBM brought to what it means to be a company, and what it means to be a family, and what it means to be a community. Uh, you don't necessarily get that when you immerse yourself in the go-go atmospheres of, 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 of startups right away. So, you know, um, I did advise a number of people at the Media Lab, students who graduate, take that 
Well, now it's Google, or it might be Facebook, or it might be elsewhere. There are big companies now. Um, but before you do your first startup, it doesn't hurt to get some of that experience. Interesting. That's, uh, that's good to hear. I, I, I'm working at Intel currently, and uh, oh, that's, that's reassuring to hear, because eventually I'm going to start my own. Um, Who doesn't? Who doesn't start their own company yet? Who How many people here are, are going to be starting their own company? Or uh, see that as, well, we got the right crowd here then. <laughs> I think everybody does nowadays, don't they? It's, it's, it's uh, I, when I was a kid, it was always a dream, right? To, uh, to have uh, my own venture, my own company, me guide and change the world in a particular, in a very particular way. Um, and uh, and I, I think it's great. So uh, another question uh, about Tivoli. Uh, mm -hmm. Earlier today, we were talking uh, about uh, your, your very first competition, right, which was um, with, uh, the name Computer Associates. We were talking about Computer Associates uh -huh. and, and how Tivoli had had this uh, this obstacle to get through. Uh, computer Associates were the <coughs> controlled at least, or had the majority of the mm -hmm. server software and, uh, and you know, everything was changing, there were new opportunities, and Tivoli jumped on the gun and eventually beat out, or, or did, very well, even though uh, computer associates, you know, really ha would have the ability to take control. What What do you think? Uh, Tivoli did correctly in, in in getting into a market and being able to do well, even though there was such uh, big other companies who had the potential to do the same. Well, that's a good question. Um, I think one of the um, advantages. I mean, we were very lucky to have computer associates out there um, because they were uh, kind of a big. Uh, kind of nasty company that was easy to dislike and even even customers dislike them. But um, I, I think the lesson to be learned there was, I think the reason we were able to take on computer associates and Hewlett Packard and IBM and others is because we had a strong belief in the right way to do things. And so the goal, you know, wasn't just, well, let's build a company and let's make a lot of money and be famous. Uh, we like that too. Yeah. Um, but there was a deeper thing to it. I mean, we really believed that what we were doing was right. That as computing went from those big mainframes to personal computers and so forth, that the other guys were doing it wrong. The way it was being done was wrong and that there was a much better way to do it. Um, and and we, were, uh, we were passionate about that. And uh, I, I think it was that passion in that we believed in what we were doing. And we could tell that story uh, with feeling. I mean, I, I think that, uh, and folks here from Tivoli, uh, I, I wonder whether you, you think this is a, an accurate view of it. Uh, history is different, but we, we believed in what we were doing. We were on a mission. Uh, and we believed it was right, we believed it was better for customers, and it was the right way to do it. And when you have that passion, uh, then you can be successful from there. And it generates that kind of strong uh, community within the company, that family feeling that energy you get together to go and kill the other guys. But that's because you believe that what you're doing is right. Now whether you're doing a social media startup or you're doing a medical device startup or, or whatever, I, I think that the only way to do it is to start with a true belief and a true passion that what you're doing is correct uh, and right. It's gonna make somebody's life better, it's gonna, it's gonna be better. And I, I think that was the key that created the kind of energy, uh, camaraderie, uh, the spirit of fun that we had together um, that energized the company and, and, uh, and I think catapulted us to uh, the success that we had. No, absolutely. So it's the things that you really don't think about when you, when you try to put up in bullet points what you should do right. It's, uh, it's really not, not a bullet point at all. It's just uh, it's believing in what you do. I think it's, I mean, it's you know, I, I dealt with a lot of uh, entrepreneurial uh, um, classes at MIT, uh, just like you have here, uh, and there's so many of them now. Um, uh, entrepreneur groups, angel groups, etc. And they're all anxious to learn how to build a business plan. And it seems that the exercise is, well, how do you build that business plan? Uh, it's not, I mean, the business plan comes. I, I'm not sure we quite had a business plan or a set of charts. Uh, it was just, you know, a bunch of darts on the wall, and we had people who actually produce something that looked like a business plan. Um, but it is, it, doing startups is not about doing business plans. It's about having ideas how to do things better, uh, believing in it, and then partnering up with other people to do it. And if you got a great idea and it solves somebody's problem, then the business plan will come. 
awesome. Earlier you had said how I'm not against business plans. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it's a good it's a good exercise. But. You'd said you had talked about how uh, how Tivoli really has with you because of the guts, right? Of uh, <laughs> because you guys wanted wanted what you believed, and uh, you guys really had the drive to to go ahead and get it. And, uh, and uh, so oh, I think so. And it's also it, there's an element of luck, and I, I think the luck that comes out of it in Tivoli and other companies is when a certain group of people come together at a certain time, and they have chemistry. Uh, they, uh, you know, have a feeling of bonding between them and a shared goal. And uh, some of the people who were here in the room today were part of that. Uh, we were lucky that when we added people to the team, whether it was salespeople or marketing people or other people, it was mostly engineers when I came down, I think about 15 or so. Uh, and then we began to, to build it. And we were, we were actually quite selective in the people that we added. Uh, and we were lucky, I think, to be able to get people who kind of share the same kind of uh, philosophy that you could have fun, you could work hard, you could win, you had a passion. And um, it's that team, it's, it's all about the people. Really, it's not about the business plan, it's about the passion, it's about the people. And we were frankly lucky, I think, that we had a great group of people who came together. They not only got along, but they, they felt uh, close to one another, and I think they supported one another, they cared about one another. We, had, we went through some good times, we went through some bad times, as well as the family does. But we were lucky to be able to bring that, that team of people together. And we're glad you did, because uh, that's we created Chivalry. Right? Um, so and, and did you meet these people in Austin? And why, why did you guys choose to, to come to Austin? Uh, the company was founded before I came. So I've got a you know, total <laughs> disclosure. Um, uh, four uh, people from, uh, from IBM Austin uh, founded the company. I don't know if any of them are here today. Rats, they didn't show up. Huh? <laughs> well, they don't even deserve a mention. Uh, uh, but uh, they were uh, they were a, a group at uh, a Unix group at uh, at IBM Austin, uh, and they were thinking about uh, new ways to, to manage Unix systems. Uh, and uh, they went and they split it off, and they, they split off. They formed the company. Uh, they brought in a bunch of uh, engineers and others. And I arrived. Uh, they'd already gotten them off the ground, and there was a a very, very early prototype. Hmm, that's probably <laughs> a strong statement. There was the idea of some code. <laughs> and uh, and uh, that, that was the beginnings. But uh, it, we also had a, a very um, a fortunate set of circumstances whereby uh, an organization of companies called the Open Software Foundation, which no longer exists, uh, was actually kind of an anti-Microsoft group. Uh, was getting together, and they were looking for cool ideas and software for the Open Software Foundation, and we could, we put that as our first site was to actually win the competition for the Open Software uh, bid to create a systems management offer, and we did it, and it's a pretty big thing. Um, and, and we did it from just about nothing, just an idea. Actually, when we won it, we had just about nothing, I think. But, but it was the power of that idea uh, and the story that we told that I think convinced a lot of people. And it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. Eventually, we did build the software. Eventually, the software did work. I think. You can tell me whether or not. Um, but, but it came from a set of ideas and a concept. Do you think, uh, what, uh, what about Austin do you think was just perfect for, for Tivoli? What, uh, what was there particular companies that, like, like you just had talked about, the companies that just uh, helped your purpose? Or well, I've thought a lot about that in the years since. Um, and it's easy to look at Austin now and say, well, this is what it was about Austin. Uh, it was a little bit different then, uh, 1991. Um, you know, I think what was special for me, and I think other people, was that we were, there was a certain pride in Austin. Uh, you know, a certain feeling that you were building something that you were part of something early. Now, it's good to be part of the Silicon Valley or, or part of Silicon Valley or Boston, but it's kind of hard to believe right now, or even 10 or 20 years ago, that you would be a linchpin in creating that. Thing. Bob, you had the experience in, in making an early contribution uh, with your company. And I think you know that feeling. And I think the feeling of Tivoli was, we were part of Austin. I think there was a very strong identification with being part of a cool place and the kind of camaraderie, the kind of uh, friendship, and the kind of community that comes from that, which has created a, a great atmosphere. I think the other thing about Austin that's great 
is that we're, we're, we're at least as smart, we're smarter than Boston or Silicon Valley, but we're neither as narcissistic as Silicon Valley, nor as arrogant as Boston. And so if you take the brains, you take the energy, but you take the arrogance and the, and the narcissism out, uh, you get a group of people who I think um, can, uh, can be very successful at entrepreneurship because, you know, I think it's, uh, those are the kind of components. I think, I think, uh, I mean, I can speak only for myself, but uh, I'm pretty sure everyone in the room feels so much relief to hear that uh, that Austin has, is such a great place. And uh, more than relief, maybe, maybe just feels a great uh, pride, right, uh, about Austin. Because I, I know I do. I, I think it's that pride. I mean, I think it's pride of being a part of something that's growing and then changing the world, and you'll look back and say you were a part of it. <laughs> I think some other things about Austin that contribute to entrepreneurship, believe it or not. Uh, you know, a good entrepreneur knows how to tell a story. I mean, your company very early on is nothing but a story. Right, it may be a business plan, um, but you tell a story. And you know, Texans are great at telling stories. Right, I mean, what do they say? If, if, uh, if bullshit were snow, and uh, you know, if you saw high here in Austin. Uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, we told a few stories. And people, so people actually want to hear stories. Uh, you know, they want software that works eventually and things that make a difference, but, uh, you know, even, I mean, certainly today, people are looking for stories about how we can attack some of these challenges of society that we have today. Um, and I think Texans are really, uh, they're imaginative, they're creative, sometimes they stretch the truth a little bit, um, but they're willing to tell a good story, I mean, you know, beyond the PowerPoint. And I think it was the ability to tell that story and take that story out. That, that changed a lot of minds, not just people in the industry, but customers and so forth. And uh, I think Austin's great at that. I think Texas is good at that. Awesome. Right, right. Keep that stories going. Those stories yeah. are great. Yeah. We got some other points yeah. to go out. Thanks. Yeah. Storytelling. Uh, <laughs> so that's not bullshit. I mean, there's a fucking <laughs> subtle difference between them. <laughs> yeah. But there is an overlap for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you got to find that uh, that balance. That so uh, when when you look out today and you see uh, certain you hear of certain startups, you hear of certain things. Um, what is your opinion on, or do you have a favorite, say, startup that uh, that you hear of? What is, or at least not a particular favorite, but a, a certain field that uh, you see you see emerging? Well, absolutely, my favorite startup is the one I'm doing. Right now. <laughs> but uh, Bluefin lasts, um, and it's a lot of fun. It's uh, you know not going to solve big societal problems. <clears throat> but um, it's based on a really cool technology. I think it's exciting. Um, a professor, I'll tell the story a little bit, a professor at the Media Lab, Deb Roy, uh, is one of the world's experts in machine learning and artificial intelligence. And he was curious about um, really how people learn, uh, you know, so you can produce machines that learn and are smart. And so his whole career has been devoted to understanding how people learn. And when his child, his first child was about to be born, uh, he and his wife, who's a clinical psychologist and is also interested in the brain, decided to videotape every second of his child's life from the time he was brought home. Uh, audio as well as video. So he took his house <coughs> excuse me, in Arlington, Mass, and put high resolution video and audio uh, throughout the house. And then his child came home from the hospital for the first three years. They videotaped and, and took audio of every second of everyone interacting with that child. The question they were trying to a answer was, how does that child learn his first word? You know, what are the influences that are around it? Um, and um, it was, as you can imagine, quite a controversial project. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> what's that kid going to be like uh, you know, when he grows up? Uh, but what really came out of it were tools. And this is a huge amount of data that was downloaded from his house to these servers at, at the Media Lab every day. Uh, literally almost half a petabyte of data, like more than is contained uh, at Google at that time. And then the question was, how can you search through that video data now to find patterns uh, in actions, what, what people were saying to the child, what influences, what noises. It's like when you want to teach a robot uh, and you know, how, to, how to speak, you, you, you hand that ball and you say ball, right? And so it's the reverse of that process. You're trying to learn what influences. Long story short, he did that, and uh, the, the child's first word was water. Um, and that was it. He never drew conclusions from it. 
Uh, but he created an enormously interesting tools to <coughs> do data mining and pattern recognition in this huge volume of, of, of video data. And we formed a company uh, to go off and use that technology to do something cool. We didn't know what it was going to be uh, at the time we did. But today, um, servers and, and, and uh, uh, computers at Bluefin watch every moment of TV. In fact, have for the past two years. So every program, every commercial, we have a, a direct TV feed that watches. And we're looking for patterns that relate that to social media right now. So you can see what people are saying about TV programs and saying about the commercials that are aired during that. And we're, uh, we're providing a service to both networks <coughs> as well as advertisers to better understand how people in social media are commenting on their programming and on their, uh, uh, on their advertising. And we hope to, our big uh, competitor in this case isn't Computer Associates, but it's Nielsen. Uh, who provides data to um, programmers and advertisers. And we hope to kick their butt. Uh, because social media is really where attitudes and ideas and insights are being developed. <coughs> but that's uh, Bluefin, and I think uh, an exciting company. But uh, one of the things that uh, I learned at the Media Lab uh, and really got passionate about is the opportunity for technology to have a much deeper impact on our lives than what it does today. Social media is great, communications, connectivity, the things that we all do with technology today has changed our lives. Um, but I saw prosthetics for amputees that were literally robots that would not only restore normal motion in amputees, but actually will allow older people to remain active and mobile you know, well into their 90s. Um, I saw technology uh, that enabled autistic people to image the face of the person they're talking to and using you know, artificial intelligence and other technology understand what the emotions are of those people. And so um, I, I saw technology that enables robots to enable people to live independently longer by helping them with their, with their health. And all these technologies that, that, that really um, will enable people who are disabled to, to live normally and, and to restore their capability. About 50% of people are either mentally or physically disabled in some way in the world today. And so I see a whole new wave of technology coming down the pipe now that enables people with disabilities to live normal and fulfilled lives. Uh, one of the professors at the Media Lab has a startup um, that really turns for blind people, that turns the retina, uh, that, that turns normal cells in the retina into a camera. And so if you've lost your sight, you still have normal neurological cells in the back of your eye. If you can then activate them to be light sensitive, you've now tra transformed your, your eyes into a camera. And so, you know, I mention this because there's so many opportunities now to go beyond the next Facebook or Twitter or Groupon. And they're good and they're fine, but to have a deeper impact on humanity. And incidentally, I think those things can lead to huge commercial opportunities. Let me give you an example. I mentioned this prosthetic that enables people with autism to image the face of the person they're talking to and understand their emotions. Well, that allow, allows them to communicate in a way they couldn't. Autistic people uh, don't have necessarily the skill or the talent. If I'm an autistic person and I'm talking to you right now, I don't realize that you're bored to death about what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, and you just gave a little laugh, and if you're going like this, you're a fun. Tremendous challenge for autistic people. Well, this technology that's been developed at the Media Lab would enable me as an autistic person to literally understand, well, big companies like Pepsi and Bank of America and Procter and & Gamble and others came by and said, gee, how can I use that to understand the emotions of my customers as they walk into retail spaces or as they're buying things on the net? Uh, and today, a startup company called Affectiva has been formed, which is growing by leaps and bounds, that's supplying this effective recruiting technology to marketing departments and big companies, originally tailored for people with disabilities. Hugh Hare, who was developing these robotic prosthetics, uh, he's a double amputee, that enable him to not only walk again, but do ice climbing, which is kind of lost it. Uh, is now being, uh, that same technology is being used to create exoskeletons, lightweight, external prosthetics that older people can use to prevent falls as they grow older and to keep out of wheelchairs. It's a problem. So 
I see a tremendous opportunity to begin with these technologies that attack various disabilities, but then turn them into tremendous, the tremendous profitable and growing commercial opportunities. I think that's a neat model. So that's, those are the things that excite me the most right now. And, and, uh, and, you, uh, and I, I read about most of them here on that. This is Frank Moss's book, um, Sorcerers and Their Apprentices. And uh, you can hear every, uh, you read everything about the MIT Media Lab, about all these projects that he's just talking about. And, uh, and I, I read the book and I, and I liked it a lot. I loved it. And actually, we're, uh, later on, we'll, we'll give out some of these books. But um, just to, You're like a talk uh, show host there. You know, like, hold up the book and <laughs> look at the camera and say, yeah, available on Amazon. <laughs> just uh, tweet, tweet, uh, tweet us another question and you can get a book. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's a great book. I, I have to mention it because I did like it so much. Um, it was, it's, I, I, I loved one of the stories that uh, I, I come from a mecha mechanic. Uh, my, my father's a mechanic and I've been around cars my whole life. And you had you a story there about the, uh, the new car. Right. Basically, the new car and how <clears throat> uh, this team of engineers, which only out of, out of the whole team, only one was actually a mechanical engineer, uh, from di diverse uh, academics got together and, and pretty much created the future, uh, the future of the car. And uh, I, I, I love that story. And uh, one, of the, one of the things I get from it is, is how when, when you get your team together, um, really you need this diverse pool of ideas that can only come from uh, people who have studied different things. And, and what, uh, what you call the anti-disciplinary um, mm -hmm. uh, way of the MIT Media Lab, I, I find very interesting. And I don't know if, if you want to share some of that well, this is really what I learned at the Media Lab, um, and I, I really am taking that forward now. I, I think it's the key to success in the 21st century, uh, in that uh, these huge problems that we, we face now, in health and energy and education, just to name three, uh, I, I think the solutions for those are going to come from radically different areas than, than where, where the problems originate. And uh, there are at least a half a dozen different projects at the lab that convinced me of that. Uh, and, you know, it's really all about a process called serendipity. And that is, you begin uh, with some ideas and some things that you, you, you think might change the world, and you never know where they will go. Uh, but, but I think the example that you talked about is very inspiring to me. Uh, and the story really is that um, a professor at the Media Lab, who since passed away, Professor Bill Mitchell, uh, was head of architecture at MIT. And uh, he, he um, retired as head of architecture and he went to the Media Lab. And he was, a very, he was an expert in urban, the digital urban design, you know, the, the merging of cities and digital technology. And he wanted to look at the future of cities. And he wanted to uh, obviously do something transformative, uh, as people do with cities today, because you know, better than 50% of the world's population today live in cities. It's going to be about 70% within about 20 to 25 years. And so the world is urbanizing, and cities are, are a big challenge. And he basically asked the following question. He said, imagine the city you want to live in, and then design a car for that. I think it was a very interesting, cars have been designed, uh, cities have been adapting to cars throughout history. Right? People develop cars, and then cities have had to adapt to them by you know, changing you know, the way buildings are put in the cities and so forth. He simply said, imagine the car that you want. And he did something very you know, revolutionary, in my view. He brought together people, none of whom had ever designed a car. There were computer scientists. There were electrical engineers. There were uh, doctors, uh, physicians. Uh, there were lawyers. Uh, there were urban designers. And they spent practically five years just imagining and prototyping what this car of the future might look like. And along the way, they designed, they really reinvented the wheel. Uh, somebody said, well, what if you could put all of the me mechanical uh, devices, uh, mechanical elements of a car in the wheel, like the engine, you know, the suspension, the brakes, uh, the steering, you know, those are the major physical elements. You could just put them in a wheel. And they literally invented the robotic wheel, okay? And this, you, you, you know, go in the, the, the uh, lobby of the media lab and you'll see some guy riding around on this wheel, like a unicycle. And then they made a tricycle out of it. And then they designed a car that literally folds up because there's no central drive system in the car. 
And then from there, they began to think about, well, how can we stack those in front of, say, buildings in the city, like if there's shopping carts in front of the supermarket. And from there, they went to the idea that you would create a network of these cars. Okay, you'd actually rent the cars rather than buy them. And so it was just a progression of ideas that began with a very interesting question. What does the city you want to live in look like? First imagine that, and then design a carport, and bring together people from widely diverse backgrounds, none of them who you know, designed a car, and then set them free, prototype them to build. And today, uh, they're uh, currently in, uh, in Spain, uh, in, in, in near Barcelona, um, building 20 of these prototypes to be deployed inside Barcelona within the next year. The sad part of the story is that GM was an original sponsor of this project, um, but GM didn't get it, and then Ford became a sponsor of the project, and Ford didn't get it. And today, the project is being sponsored by the Consortium of Automobile Parts Suppliers in Spain. And so I regret to say that the American automobile manufacturers uh, just quite didn't get the idea of what this foldable electric vehicle that you know is, is you know you know deployed in a new way in the city, really rethinking what a car is all about as a system. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm also glad to see though that it's been embraced and that this will be rolled out in the future. <coughs> but it came through that process. Do you think that has to do so? Are, are Americans uh, too conservative? What, what do you? Why do you think uh, Ford and GM turned it down? Well, um, that's a longer <laughs> uh, <laughs> issue. Um, you know, I, I think they were, um, you know, trying to figure out a way to make what they had done in the past look good in the future, and they spent a lot of time at that. Uh, and the idea that something would disrupt their business. Um, didn't seem to be appealing to them. In fact, I think they saw this as perhaps a threat. But that's a bigger story that's kind of hard to attack here. Um, but certainly the American automobile industry is a story that I think none of us are proud of. I think it has a chance of coming back now, and hopefully it will. But it will come back, not by reproducing the GTO <laughs> or the Chevy or whatever, but it will come back by looking at a car as a different kind of thing. And I, I think the automobile industry, the information technology industry, the energy industry will all have to come together and be redefined. That's, I, I, I can't wait to see it because I'm a car lover, I'm a vehicle lover. I can't wait to see what, America, what we can do. I mean, I'd love to join that. Well, you want to get on Yeah, that's yeah. Sure. I would love to work for a car with me for sure. <laughs> um, so let's see, what uh, haven't we talked about? Ready to take questions from these guys? Yeah, what, uh, how's our time looking? I can't really see the clock. Ten of eight. Sorry? It's ten of eight. Throw me some top ones here. So, go ahead. I have a question. You talked about the importance of the team that you're with. Uh, how do you go about finding the right people? How do you know when you found the right, the right people? How, what's the max amount of people you would want? Like, where do you find these people? Just everything that has to do with finding that team, if you can talk about that. Well, that's a good question, and it's uh, different at different times and at different places. Right? Uh, there are different <coughs> dynamics as to who's available. But, um, yeah, I think the first principle is zero compromise <laughs> when you're in a small team. I think we're talking about a startup now. Right? You're trying to build a team. And, uh, you know, too often when you're trying to build a team, I've seen this not, I saw this in Tim but I've had four or five startups since then. You're in a rush, you're, you know, you want to get the product built, you want to get engineers, you want to get So you'll interview around and, and often you'll say, well, you know, this is the best we can do right now. And I think you're always better off you know, at some point you can't get the perfect person, but making compromises is not a good idea. And so early on particularly, I think it's so critical to set your standards high. Now, you know, where those people come from and how you source them, I mean, I, my experience has been that, you, you, just like at the media lab, you're looking for bright, creative people who are builders, who are uh, able to operate in a team. Somehow it doesn't matter what they've done. So if you look at their resume, all too often people focus on, well, we have to build Widget A. So we want someone who's built Widget A, or built something like Widget A, uh, or who's marketed something like Widget A. In my experience, the most successful people have been ones, I mean, they, if, if it's a programmer, they have to have programming experience. Uh, but usually it's their creativity, their ability to uh, adapt and change, to take risk. 
And, and so I would say the one thing I would look for as you build startup teams anywhere is to get people on board who are flexible, adaptable, bright, and willing to take risk and willing to fail. Now, how do you know about that in advance? I mean, you have to kind of think about that. But, but I think the most important thing about building a team is to be ready and willing to experiment, to fail, and to learn from it. And so those are the characteristics when I uh, hire somebody in a company now and I'm doing a reference check. You know, often I'll say, well, have they built this or that? I mean, it's a good thing. But I'll say, tell me, you know, have they failed? And, and what do they do, you know, when they fail? And, and how do they come back from it? And were they willing to take risk uh, and put themselves out on the edge? And nine times out of 10, I'll, if I have choices, I'll hire the people who have been willing to take risk, who have failed, who have learned that process and are willing to do it. Because a startup is really a process of taking risk, failing, adjusting, learning from it, and going on. I don't know if that, no. uh, and it's kind of counterintuitive because you tend to look for people who have done what you want to do. But actually, if there are people who have done what you want to do, then it's probably not very innovative anyway. You know? And so that might become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Question in the back. Uh, just for a couple of minutes, can you explain how you see the world in 30 years? Uh, oh. Most interesting things on the, uh, that you see that haven't been developed yet. What do you see in 30 years? Question was, but I see there. Could you tell me who you are and uh, just? Uh, my name is Jason. Jason. I work working on a little startup, dropped out of UT. <laughs> Oh, that was a good is. idea. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm just curious to see how you see it. There. Well, um, 30 years is a long time. Uh, but I, I think the biggest development and revolution we're going to see globally, uh, in my opinion, is in health. Uh, particularly, at, not just in this country, but everywhere. Um, I mean, the system of health, as it were, is it's an age-old system. I mean, it's based upon the paternalistic role played by doctors and medical professionals and kind of assumes that patients are lab rats or dumb people. Uh, but it's, it, it, and we have, in this country, we have a very sophisticated system of health if you're very sick. <laughs> and so there's no better place to be than in this country if you've got a chronic disease. But yet the level of health in our country is pathetically low. I mean, when measured by other developed nations, we're like about 47th. I mean, they're, they're developing nations that are higher on the scheme. Uh, and what I believe will happen, I don't know if in the next 30 years, but the next 10 to 15 years,